my favorites for many years. Psalm 32, 8. I will lead you and I will guide you in the path in which you shall go. I will guide you with mine eye. That's the Lord speaking to you, sisters, and you, brothers, you kids, and myself. I want you to realize something today. I don't want to ever sound elementary. You are all here. You're serving the Lord. You're not just brand new, you know, what's this about? But I want you to know that scripture, when you feel, does the Lord want to lead me individually? Does he want to lead me and my family? Does he want to lead our church out? I will lead you, and I will guide you and the path in which you're to go. And I will guide you with mine eye. That is his promise to you and I today. Isn't that powerful? What I want to talk to you about, very something simple, is I do like to, no matter what, and God, how many know God's a God of fun and humor? How many believe he created me, trust me? I told pastor and his wife at the conference we had this week, God looks at me with a whole crowd and goes, Rod, you're mine. Then he'll look at the crown and go, oh, boy, is he mine. <laughs> you know, he is a God of joy. How many know that? Come on. Come on, Al. You can and relax a little bit. I got to tell you, I always I collect fun stories in church. How many know that church can be where some of the funniest things happen? Unexpected. Some things you can't always tell. But down in Virginia, I'm from Arlington, Virginia, D.C. area, but years ago, in the church, this one church, the baptistry was way up there behind the choir loft. And the pastor let the youth pastor do the baptizing and would call it, you know, from down on the floor. And all you could see was from here up. So he had this wonderful little old lady came in in the tank. And the youth pastor, remember, all you can see is from the chest up here. And he's like, I baptize, you, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now watch me. He went like this. And he went. And remember, all you can see is from here, so you see. And finally, he brings her up, and she's, <laughs> you know, coughing huge. The whole audience is up on her feet, fearful that she was drowning. Got her out, baptized more, but after the service, he comes out with her hair drying off. People gathered around the youth pastor, including the pastor. What happened? When I took her sister down, her wig came on top of the water, and I tried to get her head under the wig. <laughs> Fun things happen in church. You got to learn to laugh in Jesus, amen? He doesn't want us all you know, like this. He wants us to be able to look at our trials, our tribulations, and say, you know what? And whoever comes against us, oh, but for the grace of God, there go you or I. If he has me covered, I'll make it through this. I want to talk about my family real quick. My mom and dad were my heroes, if you will. And my mom was probably the biggest card in church. Wherever I went in ministry, my mom and dad would come and visit Next thing in the church, I'd hear screaming and laughing, including the pastors. People like, who's that? Like, my mom. You know, <laughs> and she and dad had a gift of hospitality. But I, uh, I remember mom and dad and I used to like, my family's from the Pennsylvania Dutch country down Pennsylvania. Uh, a lot of horse and buggies in central, central PA, not Lancaster, but west of there. But we used to love as, uh, to go with them, and they liked to go to the old cemeteries and find family history. We found family members born in 1748, et cetera. And um, we love to do that. But there's one thing I want you to think about. When you see a tombstone, you see the, what's the first date that you see to the left? What? Your birth date. What do you see to the left? I mean, the right. The date of death. What's in between, typically? Somebody said it. A dash. We all have a dash when you think about it. You and I, our whole life is in that dash. It was funny, I heard, was it Larry said the other night? Because uh, you think about it, when your dash is gone, the church gathers for ham, potato salad, and say goodbye to you know, afterward. There's your life. But our dash is what is the story of our, your and I's life. And the only thing that we, have, we think we have control of is our dash. But the one, if we're a Christian, we don't have control of our dash. Who does? Jesus Christ. My question is today to you and I, folks, and it doesn't matter if you're 8, 18, 68, 88, or 108, what are you and I doing with our dash? 
I want to tell you a little bit about my Aunt Lottie. My Aunt Lottie is 97 years old. This morning right now, she's playing the organ and piano at the Arlington Assembly Church in Arlington, Virginia. Lottie is uh, an incredible organist pianist. We played together for years, would rotate. She was one of the main organist pianists, still is for the Assemblies of God, for conventions and all. Uh, Lottie grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, right across the river from you know New York, and would do street meetings in the 1930s, play the old pump organ and all. She said, I hated that. My friends would see me. She was embarrassed. She's a cool lady. But she met somebody that was deaf, and she wanted to communicate. Nobody could communicate with this deaf person. And she got into saying, I feel to do something with that. And a dear saint in the church said, oh, Lottie, you're too talented in music. You're missing the call of God by work, wanting to work with deaf people. Folks, several years back, Lottie wrote a book called The Joy of Signing that is the international book for learning sign language. Became a million bestseller. Even the Gospel Publishing House, where it was published, they told her, a book like this won't sell. So they said, well, we'll try it. We'll sell 500. 500, then 1,000. And it kept going to well over a million copies and just renewed again because she obeyed the Lord. Lottie had a lady that came to Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri back in the early 50s who's like my older sister. Her name's Linda. Linda was in music in Fort Worth, Texas in her church, in her assembly. And at 13, she got spinal meningitis. And the only medication for the severity of her disease made her deaf. And so her whole world flipped upside down pretty quick as a girl. Can you imagine being hearing the music and then within a week, your hearing's gone permanently? She didn't know what God wanted to do with her, and her family would not learn sign language. They made her learn to lip read, which the part of that's okay, but still. She didn't know where to go, and she wanted to go to Bible school, and she found out about Lottie teaching sign language at Central Bible College. So she went there, and Lottie took her on as a daughter. Lottie eventually went to um, NYU and got her Ph.D. and um, um, another subject, and they said, if you come and teach sign language, we'll pay for your doctorate at uh, NYU, downtown Manhattan. Linda came with her, and then they moved to Arlington, Virginia, to work at Gallaudet University for the deaf in D.C., and Linda said, Lottie, I have no husband. I'm not desirable, I guess, but I'd love to have children. Could I adopt a child, a deaf one, to help? And Lottie said, well, if you do, I'll be grandmother. Uh, years later, they, in a 20-year period, they adopted 29 deaf, abused children from around the world and raised them in a high-rise in Arlington. And one of those young men that they raised was in our wedding, or at our wedding last week who graduated from University of Valley Forge Bible College. God used them when they were told, what are you doing? Now, I want you to know, too, that Lottie went through major cancer surgery this past winter. She had a tumor from her rectum to her stomach, full of cancer. Removed that and did radiation and chemo. She was about done. This is her. She said, eh, God's not done with me yet. He calls the shots, not you doctors. Uh, Lottie, uh, after her surgery and after several weeks of chemo and radiation, had me get her a plane ticket to California to an international Pentecostal convention. And they look at her and say, what's going on? She goes, until he calls me, I've got a work to do. 97, organist and pianist, and still makes lunches for some of these kids because some of these kids were so brutally molested and raped and all that in other countries that some can't even barely walk, and she still helps care for these kids at 97. What is it God has put in you to do? James 4.14 states, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The psalmist David writes about it, the brevity of life several times. Psalm 102.3 says, my days disappear like smoke. How many know when you get older, it seems like the days are going faster? How many besides me don't have senior moments, you have senior hours? Psalm 144.3 says, We are like a breath of air. Our days are like a passing shadow. Job said it in Job 7, 6 through 7. My days are running out quicker than the thread of a fast-moving needle. My life is just a breath. We don't know what our next day is going to be like or what we're going to have. But I know this is, sounds elementary. 
Anybody remember Bear Bryant, football coach? Come on, somebody. I shouldn't say that up north. That's southern talk. Um, this is Yankee territory. But he would say to that football team, Alabama, guys, here's your basic football again. We need to get back and say, folks, here's our basic Bible with instructions. You know what the Bible stands for? I heard somebody give an acronym recently. Basic instructions before leaving earth. The Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. David said, show me, O Lord, my life's end and number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. How many sitting here today remember when you sat in elementary school like me and thought, I'm going to be old when I'm 25? Anybody like that kind of similar? Anybody now that sat in the past 30 years and said, 50, a half a century old? Are you kidding me? Well, I passed that a while back. Now I'm looking like, hmm, you know, it gets, gets shorter. But let me ask you this. That dash on the tombstone is what represents you and I when we're buried in the ground or however we're buried. If you and I knew today that we had 30 days left on this earth that God said, I'm giving you 30 days, ladies and gentlemen, what would we do with it? Think about it. Right now, what would you do? And remember this. You have God Almighty. Our creator is you're in my Savior through Jesus Christ, right? The God of hope, as it says in Romans. The God that will do anything exceedingly abundantly above what which we can conceive or imagine. I love Jeremiah 33, 3. Call upon me, what? In the time of, you all know that one? Jeremiah 33, 3. Call upon me in the time of trouble, and I will show you great and mighty things which you haven't seen before. This is the kind of God we have, and he wants life to be, he didn't say we would be painless, he didn't say we wouldn't have to go some hell in our lives, but he said, I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you, I'll hold your hand, I'll take you through the fire. He took the three Hebrew children into the furnace, but they came out without even smelling like smoke. You think about that. Even the people that threw them in were consumed, but they were not. And when, because they said, though, you know, no matter what happens, we're still going to serve him, basically, today's terms. Folks, what are you and I going through that our God can't deliver, that our God can't take us through? What is your purpose here? How do you know that what you and I are going through today is not to help somebody else and say, oh, but for the grace of God, there go you or I, but I can be there and tell you. He brought me through. We used to sing an old hymn in the church years ago. He brought me out of the miry clay. He put my feet on a rock to stay. I have to stop and think about it, Pastor. He put a song in my heart to stay. A song of praise, hallelujah. Folks, God wants you to, in the midst of hell, to be able to say, I can praise him. I can have joy. Though I made the most stupid decisions, I don't know about you, but at times I feel I grew up in the dumb tree and hit every dumb branch on the way down. Can anybody relate to me on that? Come on now, he's going to preach on lying next week. How many can believe that? How many know that you feel at times? Come on, how many do stupid? Both hands and both feet on my case. But isn't it great that God understands? And don't you rather be, wouldn't you rather be around real people that are down to earth and that put the fake on and the judgmental? I'm being real. I make mistakes. But what would you and I be doing different today if you had 30 days? Come on, think about it. I want you to really think about it right now. Oh, Pastor Rod, I've made so many mistakes. Well, welcome to life itself. We all have. It's how we hide it. But I want to talk to you about how living the life really matters. Understand that God made you and I for a purpose. If I sound elementary, so be it, because I'm preaching to myself too. I need to hear this before you need to hear it, because I need to remind myself how good I've got it in God. I, I know today I have uh, shelter over me. I have clothes on my back. I came in here, made it coming up here to this building. I've got food on the table. No kidding, Sherlock. I've got lots of food on the table that I need to let go down a little bit. We are a blessed people. I want you to stop for a moment, too. You think about, how many remember the old hymn, Count Your Blessings? One upon life's billows, you are tempest-tossed. Right there. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. How many have friends here? Most of you? Are you unfriendly? How many have, this is family to you here. 
How many, in my case too, sometimes the church is closer family to me than some of my own family. I'll be honest with you, I have two older brothers. Breaks my heart, I had to put one in a mental home a number of years ago. And my oldest brother didn't come to the wedding last week. He can't handle a crowd of two or more, three or more people. We all got things in our families. I love him dearly. He loves it when I call him. He's 69 years old, but he backs off from things. The middle brother uh, drank and, uh, on his depression medicine, blew his mind out. It destroyed my folks because my folks were wonderful, retired military people that loved the Lord. Every family's got something. So I don't feel like, oh, look at me. I've got all this wonderful... No, it hurts still to know that my middle brother and I haven't talked for six years, his choice. I don't even know if he knows my mom passed away two years ago. We all have stuff. So I have nothing better up here than you have back there. I've got issues too. I've done dumb. I've done ridiculous. I've done things as though, God, how did you get me through that? You can hear God up there. Mm. You know, how many can ever hear God? Mm. I kept you out of that. Especially years ago, I don't want to go back what I did stupid more than I do now. But how many know it, it's good to be real? You made bad choices. How many besides me have made bad choices? You're not where you wanted to be now. But here you are. But God is still here, and he knew you and I would be here today. Listen to what God is saying here. I love this. Oh, Lord, you made all the fragile, delicate parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Your workmanship is marvelous. You were there while I was being formed. Think about that. God was in your mother's womb as you're being formed. You were there while I was being formed. You saw me before I was born, and you scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. That's intense. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. Think about that. And I'm not blowing smoke here, folks. God considers you and I his masterpieces. Think about that. It's hard to fathom, am I right? It's hard to really think, Rod, I'm ready to go to lunch like this. I can't imagine that God really believes I'm a masterpiece with all the stupid stuff or the mistakes and the heartaches. Yes, he does. Because if everything was perfect, we wouldn't need a perfect Savior. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Our dash, folks, when we give our body, our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not our own anymore. You don't belong to you. I don't belong to myself. I am under his authority. And if you don't feel that today, I challenge you even right now, make it right with the Lord. If there's something between you and him right now, what a perfect time but to say in your heart, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I repent. Lord, I need you more than ever before. You could do it right now. We don't have to have a major altar call. God wants you right now to be right with him with this huge smile, with open arms saying, let me show you how much I love you. God's not up there, folks, with a big whip. God's up there saying, I died for your mess ups. I died for your mindset. I died to bring healing. God, I don't understand why you allowed me to go through this. I don't know, but I know one thing. He's there to say, let me take you through the fire. Some of you ladies I can feel in here, it's like, what am I going to do next? He knows. He knows. Jesus told the story of three men who were challenged to live their dash well. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 25, chapter 14. We all know this, but boy, some things came out of here that really opened my eyes. Now, I love the King James, so I'm using the new King James. It just takes a few of these and thous out, but I love this book. I'm going to read this, if you would follow me, from chapter 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately went on a journey. Now, let me stop right there. A talent doesn't mean like, well, Pastor Rod can play the piano. That's a talent. But what they're talking back then were wages, money, a talent. And some experts, some theologians say it was equal to 15 years of wages. That's a lot. How about it? Can you imagine having 15 years of wages given to you? These guys were ordinary servants. And let's go down to verse 16. Then he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. 
But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with him. You following me? Make sure you're there with me. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look here, you have what is yours. But, there's the big B-U-T, his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, I uh, take the talent from him and give it to him who had ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken. Now here's the verse that really, I had not seen it this way before, but verse 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That hit me like a ton of bricks. What have I done, Rod Horner, with the gifts that God has given me to use? Have I allowed him to multiply them? To add them, or have I taken and wasted that which God's given me? What about you? What has caused you? I say this, a number of friends and I go and do music conferences around the country, and I ask this question, and the same reaction everywhere. How many here have been hurt? How many have been hurt in church? How many, like me, have caused hurt? How many have been hurt by church people? How many have been hurt so bad that somebody said something so hurtful that you said, I'm not going to ever do this again in church? You don't have to. Yep. I've seen so many people in the music departments and churches that were so talented. Or they were diamonds in the rough that they needed to be undergirded and said, you can do it. They were just needing to be nurtured, cared for, loved, even healed. But somebody, well, sister so-and-so told me I, can, I can't sing good. Sally and I have a pastor that we work with. He's known as real fun and goofy and all that stuff. But he can't sing worth anything. But so many people have told him, we'll, we'll, we'll pay extra tithes and offerings if you keep your mouth shut and not sing. And he'll laugh. But one time I was in the sanctuary with him, and I said, why don't you sing? I can't. Who told you? A lot of people. Is it anybody ever said, not that I'm God here, hear me. I don't mean like I'm Mr. Wonderful. Hear my heart. You're the same heart as I am. I said, come over here to the piano. Sing this. I can't. Come on, try it. Took one minute, but within one minute, he started to sing everything on key. And the look in his face, I did that? Yeah, you did that. Do it again. He did it again. You can sing, buddy. It takes some work, but everything that's worth anything doesn't just come like that. But the look on his face that stuck with me started voice lessons with him in the church. Folks, you know how many of us are pushed aside and miss God's goal because of things said and done that brought hurt against God's people? I've seen many churches where God was about to do something wonderful, but the amount of pain and fighting and arguing, we've all been there. I've done stupid. But, you know, God gives talents, and it doesn't mean singing. It doesn't mean just keyboard. It doesn't mean just preaching. God has called some of you to be wonderful workers in this area, tradesmen, nurses, accountants, uh, work, uh, blue-collar workers. God needs all of those. Amen? He needs you. And how do you not know that God did not call you where you're at, that maybe you can't stand it, that God's in a region can't stand it because all hell can't stand you being there because I'm going to use you to be a witness. 
I can use you. I can take you places. You know, do you consider your job maybe your mission field? Your trade, your mission field. Think about it. I want to tell you in today's terms what a talent can represent. This isn't all inclusive. It's just some. Your, a talent can be your ability or your abilities, your spiritual gifts, your body, your money, your special gifts like music, art, sports, woodworking, etc. Here's what the Lord offers us. If you need to write this down after, I'll give it to you. He offers to make us a new creation to forgive us our sins and start life anew, to clean up our past, to place his Holy Spirit inside of you and me, to give you and I unlimited access to his throne. Think about that right there. You and I have unlimited access. Doesn't matter if you're 8 or 89 or 109, you and I can go to the throne of grace and say, Jesus, and he's right there for us. The God that spoke the universe out of nothing is your and I's God today that says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He promised to give you and I unlimited access to the throne, to equip you to defeat the devil and the forces of hell, to give you the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That blows me away. The same power that raised somebody, especially Jesus from the dead, you and I have access to that power. I don't know about you. I'm sure I know about you. I can't conceive that, can you? It seems too far out. But he gives it to you and I. We're the ones that box God in, not God. We put a fence around him. Will God do this? This is how I can handle it. What would happen today if you and I threw our hands up and said, whatever you want, do it. Just make the instructions clear. Let's go for it. I want you to get a little bit excited. Come on. You're, you and I are Christians. He will be with us even to the end of the world to give us power to overcome every circumstance and every obstacle that comes our way, to give you and I joy, to give you and I a hope, to give you and I a peace that passes all understanding, to give you and I a purpose for living every day. That's what he wants. There's people that are bedridden in nursing homes that are going more for the Lord than a lot of people that are walking around healthy. God can use you where he plants you. Young people, God wants to use you. He has a plan for you all. He has a plan for you to do things exceedingly abundantly above any thing we can conceive in this world. He can create money to come to you from people that send you you have no idea. We have a dear pastor friend. God called him years ago to go to Moody Bible Institute. He had four young kids. His own family said, you're, you're an idiot. They did. His wife said, if you do this, I'm going to leave you. But he finally, through all that, even though the people near him said, you're a fool. You don't have the money. Well, call God was so strong in him. He got there to Moody, had enough that he sold some things in Chicago. And when he finally got to the place he was going to rent, there was a check there. And somebody from the West Coast had no idea who he was. But they had a check sent to that address that God told him for him to fill in for more than enough to carry his rent, his food, and everything for the family for more than enough time frame until he got settled in. Miracles still happen. We see hokey stuff out there. We see weird stuff on TV. No, God is still the real God that does the real deal today. If you, if you are feeling weak on the inside, he is your strength. If you don't know how to laugh, he'll give you joy for that. Secondly, God is returning to settle accounts. Look at again, as we read, the man with one talent ran from his opportunity. He hid it. He did nothing. He thought his one talent was insignificant. Maybe he compared himself to the other guys who got more. I've done that. What about you? I always say this, there's always going to be somebody better looking than me, richer than me, thinner than me, better in shape than me, can play better than me, can sing better than me, can preach better than me, can't get a better looking wife than me now. <clears throat> but God, you know what, we compare. <clears throat> Come on, be honest. I don't like to look at myself in the mirror, and I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> I don't like what I see. I know what I could do better. I could eat less, and, you know, I'll, I'll stop going there. But we compare, folks. The reason we don't have a lot today, what Jesus Christ wants for you and I individually, for you and I and our families, and folks, God already started speaking to my heart walking in this place. God can have you all take this territory for Jesus Christ. 
I know in my heart, and I've been hearing it all morning, God is speaking to people that's going to say, go to that place right here and meet with them. And there's already people that God is speaking to. When we step out in faith, God will say, that's all I want. You know, before you even step out, as your heart says step out, before you get that foot there, God's already there saying, okay, let's go. He is more your backup, your support, your hero, your cheerleader than anybody in our families could ever be. That's the kind of God we serve. God will ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? Have you buried your life in any capacity? Have you retreated because you've been hurt, rejected, tormented, jealous, envious, angered, say that you're just not going to try again or be hurt again? Or you're just too busy? Are you mad at God? My old pastor's wife, my spiritual mom, still living. She used to get mad at God in front of the pastor. He goes, don't you do that. I, Rod and I are going to walk away. You're going to be a lightning rod there. And she said, he can understand me. He's my heavenly father. I may be mad at him, but I'm not disrespectful. I can go to my papa and tell him how I feel and say, I'm mad at you for not doing this. And then God speaks to her. Well, here's why I did it. Okay, now I got the answer. But you see, she came open, but not 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 being negative, not disrespectful. But God wants to know what we're thinking and feeling. You and I must get to the point in our lives today where we identify and cultivate, invest the prize and enjoy the gifts that God has given you and I. Some of you here have tremendous gifts of hospitality. You know one of the greatest things that when you go into a church is when people greet you and hug you? That can set or make or break a church. I've been in some churches, oh, they're huge and all this. You feel like you're nothing, like a number I'd rather be here on a group of people that love the Lord and love each other than go to a place that's haughty and they think they're better. But at the same time, God is wanting you to reach this area for him. You can do it. You can do it because it's not on your own or not my own. We can do anything in the name of the Lord as he gives direction. What you and I do matters, period, finished. They say it like this in sign language, period, finished. He's giving you the equipment. He's giving you the tools. It's what you and I do with it. But what bothered me the most toward me, I'm not saying to you, to me, is for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't want to be that. I don't care what age you are, nor do it's the Lord. He can use you where you're planted right now. Give him a chance. Stop saying I can't, or I don't know if this I'm capable. I don't have the education. I don't have the means, really. And I'm preaching to myself, if God is before you, who can be against you? Start quoting these scriptures. I'm finishing up now. But I want you to think about it. Take the whole, take whatever's in your life right now, the worst case scenario, But I want you to do something. I don't care again. And I mean this respectfully. When I say I don't care, you know I'm not being negative. I'm just saying, compared to what God can do, it doesn't matter, right? The negatives. What's your worst fear, anxiety, problem? And I want you to look at it through your human eyes. But now I want you to look at it through God's eyes. Think about it. Lord, show me how you see. You know what? There's people right around this area. You can look at all the new buildings and old. People need the Lord. Just you saying, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. And if it means cook a pot, make, bake a pie, take something to them. Have hot dogs outside the building here for the kids and say, we love you with the love of Jesus. I don't know what the Lord's telling you, but he isn't saying that you have to do all this raising millions of dollars. He's saying, what, what do you have in your hand? What does Rod Horner have in his hand? Okay, I can play the piano, but I'm thankful to God, but that's not going to make everybody come to church. If I had a rotten, stinking attitude after I came out there, what good would that do? It actually bring a mar against the name of Jesus. But some of you, just all you have is to be able to stand at a door and greet somebody. Somebody's in the hospital, somebody's sick, and go over and pray with them. I'd rather have somebody come pray with me than somebody preach at me. How about you? I'd rather, it means a lot when when a dear sister comes to me and I made this for you. I hope you enjoy it. How many remember those kind of things? It means a lot. You have little is much when God's in it. Where are you hurting today? Where have you failed God? 
besides me. But God wants to do something with you, young people. God has a plan. Older folk, God has a plan. God can take all those things that you went through and give you greater wisdom and discernment. And it doesn't matter what your background, your color, your creed, your religion, it doesn't matter. How many know we are all equal at the cross of Calvary? Do you believe that? I don't care if you're the highest ranking officer in this town or, or the, 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 I can't even think of the term, uh, the, uh, not the governor, governor of the state, whatever. God isn't a respecter of persons. God's looking at your and I's heart. We have the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that will do anything if we listen to ask him. But Rod, I'm still hurt. Okay. But he'll still take the sting out. We had a lady that sang at our wedding last week, a dear friend for years. She's with the New York Metropolitan Opera. People are like, oh my, listen her sing like an angel. She did. When she sang on Sunday morning, his eyes on the sparrow wasn't a dry eye in the place. She took it up through the rafters and her heart's pure. She's got some issues. She found, she's a, uh, her husband's originally from one of the islands, the Caribbean. She found out in the past few years that he had a wife and kids down there that she didn't know about. She has two children in college. So she wound up leaving him. I mean, he wouldn't change his ways, but the daughter blames her for the breakup of the marriage. And here he had gone overseas and had a wife and kids there and just didn't care for his own. Then she got lupus. She's lost a lot of her teeth in her mouth. She's so embarrassed to sing. This is a lady that sings for her living. Then she's had major blood clots. She had to have a huge hysterectomy surgery with the blood clot situation a little over two months ago. She's been in despair. She's lost her living. All she knows is to sing, and God's used her. So we brought, asked her to come, and she sang at our wedding, and the Holy Spirit began to move. And to see her just sing there with tears. It always looks good when we can come into church. Oh, praise God. I remember as a kid growing up, we'd be in the car riding in the backseat with mom and dad. How many besides me ever grew up in the car and your mom and dad are yelling, shut up back there, you know, keep it down, stop breaking things. You know what I'm saying, not necessarily shut up, but you're going to get it. We walk in church, oh, praise the Lord, you know, we put on our facades. But Lisa came in and then when we found out, a number of singers were there with me and uh, with Sonia for our wedding and we went out to brunch on Monday and one of the guys looked over and said Rod, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me he never met Lisa before I'm going to give $500 now can we get some others to give money and let's pay for her dental surgery she stood at Sonia about 15 minutes you held her just as she was weeping she said, I don't even know these people I don't know them but the Holy Spirit did why can't God touch you where you need to be? Why is it you think that God can't minister th through all the things you've done? If God can use me, I want to tell you this as I close. If God can use me, you don't know my past. You don't know my mistakes. You don't know how I used music as a teenager to get places so I could have fun and do things I shouldn't and more. You don't know. I don't know what you've done. I don't care to know in a respectful way. I just care about where you're going from here. God only cares about where you're going from here. But here's the last part. I'm a true pastor. I can say three points and I'll give you five. God can take anything and multiply it, do exceedingly abundantly what you can imagine or conceive. God is wanting to do something in this place today with you all. But I want to tell you something. It's not about numbers. Numbers aren't what affect me or you in church. But numbers are souls, if we look at it that way. And God wants you all, I know it in my heart today, God wants to use you all to build the kingdom. This area around here is hurting. There's people right now that if they died right now, they'd go to hell. You could be the very cup of water that gives to them the answer. Don't short yourself anymore today. Stop shorting yourself of what God wants to do. If God can use me, he can use you, trust me. 
And it doesn't matter if you're from this country, from Africa, from Jamaica, from Trinidad, if you're from the South, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how many marriages failed or, or relationships or the things that no one should ever know about. They're so nasty or it doesn't matter. He's the cleaner upper. If he can take the woman at the well, clean her up. If he, you look at everybody that God used in the Bible, he didn't pick the best. He picked people that stuttered. He picked people that had how many husbands and the one she was with wasn't her husband. He picked people, a tax collector that people can not stand. He didn't pick the hierarchy. Jesus hung out with publicans and sinners. He hung out with people that he could be real with. He's here to hang with us. Close your eyes with me. And I'm preaching to me, folks. This is all back to me. Can you let go of the past and give it to God? Number one. Number two, can you say, here I am, Lord, I want to be used? Number three, can you say, I need to let this go because I am fighting letting go some things that I want to, but I don't want to. I want to, but I don't want to. Let go. He'll help you to say, Lord, I don't know how to. I've been there. I don't know how to, but Jesus helped me, and he did. He's your best friend. Number three, God, I do need to take care of family, or I need I need to be, be able to pay these bills. I need to be able to feel, I need to be able to feel good. Just to go to bed at night and sleep good would be a miracle. Any of these things, and God, I, I'd love to be used to win people to Christ, but I feel like my life's messed up, it is, but God, I know you're talking to me. I know you can use me. You're not looking for perfection, you're looking for availability. How many here today with all eyes closed, please? No one looking around. I ask of you for sensitivity reasons. How many today? No one, please. I'm not even opening my eyes at the moment, but I'm going to. But how many today with your heads bowed, your eyes closed? No one looking. No one seeing what you're doing. How many need the Lord Jesus, first of all, that you really have walked the path, but you haven't accepted him? If you haven't really accepted him as Lord of your life, and you want him today, I'm not going to embarrass you. Lift your hand. Come on. If you've never accepted him as Jesus, Savior, no one looking, please, no one. Lift your hand to me if you've never accepted him as Savior. Lift your hand where I can see it. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you, young people, too. How many today would really like to go out of this place in? I've been hurting, but I know I can, that the Lord wants to heal me. But Pastor Rod, I need him to do something in my life today because I don't want to feel like this anymore. If that's you, lift your hand. Yes, 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 yes. A lot of you. How many today just lift your hand and say, I need the God of hope to give me hope. I need to know that I can walk out of this place and not dread the future or dread home or dread work or dread being by myself. I need him. Lift your hand. Oh, yes. Here's the big one. Lord, I want to be used. You're saying to me, Pastor, I do want to be used. I want to be used by the Lord to be incredible, but what do I have to offer? Stop labeling what you think you have to offer and let him use you right where you're at. A hug, a handshake, an invitation to lunch or dinner from you to a friend or somebody, and just listen to them. And a simple prayer is more than most televangelists this day are doing. People need people that know the Lord. If you want to be used by God simply and you just want to give him your availability, lift your hand right now. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, move in this room right now. I pray. I pray where there's hopelessness now for hope to come in. I pray where there's been anxiousness and heartache and not feeling like they can get through it right now. God, you show them. You're going to lead them through. I pray right now for inner turmoil to go out of this room in the name of Jesus. I pray for the peace that passes all understanding to come over every lady and gentleman and, and young person in this room right now. God, we're going to begin to praise you. I will ask you right now, if you're able, lift your hand with me and begin to just thank him for what he's going to do. Stop telling him how he has to do it. Just let him be God and let him speak to you. Come on, lift your hands. Just begin to thank him. That's all. You don't need to pray a great prayer again. Just say, Lord, you lead me. 
You lead me the way you want to lead me. I'm going to trust you, God. Lead me. I'm going to trust you to heal me. I'm going to trust you to give me joy and peace that's beyond an understanding. Lord, I'm going to trust you to give me a great night's sleep tonight without a lot of medication. Lord, I'm going to trust you to give me a peace that I can be by myself in the bed. I'm going to trust you, Lord, that when I don't know how to pay the bills, you're going to make a way. I may have to go through a few more things, but you're going to give me peace that you're going to take care of me. God, I'm going to trust you to give me peace about my family. You know how far away that one is going or that one is or what that one's causing trouble. Lord, we give them with, we agree with the family members here. You make a way where there seems to be no way. In Jesus' name for every child, every brother, every sister, every, uh, every grandchild, every nie nephew, niece, and family's friends, we give them to you. We can't do it ourselves, but you can, but we name them. We call out their names before you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, for this church, you have planted this lighthouse here on this third floor in this beautiful facility. And Lord, there's more to come. There's much more. And together right now as a church, we stand on the vision that God, you want to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can imagine or conceive. Lord, we ask you to use everyone in this room to build the kingdom of God in this area. Lord, like Jabez, bless us indeed in a large our territory. God, enlarge the territory around this church. There is a property, there is a building, something to grow even and more to. Nothing is impossible. Folks, I'm going to tell you something I'm hearing right now from the Lord. Just trust me and reach out with a cup of cold water to those around you. You have no idea who you're going to be reaching to and how I'll carry the word. There are officials even in this town that will hear of this church and will come at some point because they're going to need somebody to pray with them. There are some officials in this area, whatever capacity, they're going to go through some tragedies. And you people in this church will be the ones that will be there to love them and to care. And as a result, they will come into the kingdom of God. Don't short yourselves on what a cup of cold water can do to reach this community for Jesus Christ. Yes, the drugs are rampant, but you know what these young people need and even older ones than drugs? They need you giving them a cup of cold water. For the gates of hell will not prevail when you stand in the name of Jesus. Folks, let God be in you. Let God speak to you and use you the way he wants. Just be available right now. Come on, begin to praise him now. Let me touch him, let me touch Jesus so that others may know and be blessed. I don't know if you know that. Do you know that, brother? Oh, to be his hand extended. Would you stand with me? Lift your hands to him and repeat after me. I'm not what I was before. I'm not where I'm going to be yet. But I am in his will right now. And I accept his will for me. And Lord, I ask you, make the directions clear for the day. And I will obey. Use me for your kingdom. Use me, God, to be your channel of your love. Use me today, Lord, where I'm at. Use me, God, exactly where you have me planted. Change me from the inside out. Use me at my age. Use me in my body where you have me. Use me in my neighborhood. Use me in my workplace. Use me in my school. 
Use me in my vocation. Use me in this church. If God be for us, who can be against us? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let my dash, my life of that dash, count for the kingdom of God. Let me make a difference in others' lives, and you will bless me in turn, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. May my life, my dash, my life, make a difference for the kingdom of God today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Nelson, would you come and take the offering this morning? Everything that you have done in this place, Father. And for everything that you are going to do, Father. Hallelujah. You are Jehovah Jireh, the one that provides. You have provided for this place, Father. And for my brothers and sisters, Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. It is here with us, Father. Bless in our hearts, Father. Hallelujah. You are the El Shaddai. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. We praise you, Father, for what you have done. And I thank you, Father, for the tithes and offerings, Father, that is going to be given today, Father, for your kingdom. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the name that is above all names, amen and amen.
Amen. What a great service. Amen. Let's all stand as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the work that you've done here today. Lord, we know it's not by might or by power, but it's by your spirit. Thank you for touching our lives, touching our soul, our spirit. Thank you for healing, deliverance. It's not man-made, it's spirit-led. Father, thank you for this day. Now, Lord, as we go our separate ways, I pray, God, that we will remember this touch from your heavenly presence. That, God, we will move this week in your strength and your ability to face whatever we have to face. Give us traveling mercies as we go our separate ways. And, Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. And we all agree in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Please come and greet one another and greet our brother and sister. Amen.